started. So welcome to a brand new quarter and a brand new year of the Behavior Evolution and Culture Seminar Series. Uh, we have a brand new web page to go with uh, the brand new year. So um, it's actually ready to go and should be live in just a couple of days. And that will have the complete schedule uh, for winter quarter up on it. So um, you can access that at beth.ucla.edu. Um, soon. Soon, soon. Hopefully by the next time I'm standing here in front of you, it will yep. be live. Okay. <laughs> so um, we have a great list of speakers coming. Um, and that... Um, starts this week and then next week uh, Bruce Winterhalder is coming from UC Davis Department of Anthropology and his talk is titled Behavioral, Eco Behavior Behavioral Ecology Models of Habitat Infill and the Evolution of Prehistoric Despotism. So he is a, an evolutionary archaeologist so that should be an interesting talk. And this week um, I'm very happy to introduce Moshe Hoffman who is coming, um, he's a postdoc at UC San Diego and he's going to be talking about the biological basis of sex differences. So, welcome. Okay, so this is uh, work co-authored with Anna Dreber, um, and uh, parts of the data I'll be presenting uh, are co-authored with Oregonese, and it's been advised by uh, Dan uh, Fessler as well. Um, so, um, well, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, risk and competitive preferences which are things that um, economists care about because they have relevance to uh, labor market outcomes, like what jobs we pick and what wages we get. Um, and uh, uh, they're relevant to uh, biological questions, particularly of sex differences, because they might uh, conceptually relate to ideas like aggression um, and uh, competitiveness like we see in animals uh, over mates. Um, so we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about animal evidence. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, behavioral evidence in the field, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and connect connect them all together um, in this overarching theme of what is the biological basis of sex differences in risk and competitive preferences. Um, so, uh, so first, why, why do economists care? So, women make considerably lower wages than men. They're found in very different occupations, and they're less likely to rise in uh, the hierarchy. Um, and recently, these sex differences in risk and competitive preferences have been offered as one possible explanation. Um, so uh, it's not meant to be the only reason, um, uh, like uh, discrimination, uh, for instance, is, is thought to still play a role, as is the, the um, taking leave uh, uh, for a child uh, labor and care. Um, but uh, differences in preferences are also thought to uh, be involved. And uh, recently, uh, uh, Kinesi uh, led and list, uh, and actually some of this research was presented here last quarter, uh, argued for a role of uh, socialization in uh, uh, affecting uh, sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is the role of evolutionary selection. Uh, okay. So um, uh, some of the, uh, so this is based on a review paper with, uh, with Anna Drever. Uh, some of the evidence uh, discussed in the review paper was presented here last quarter, so I'll try and go through that evidence very quickly and discuss the other evidence uh, in more depth. Uh, and I'll also maybe talk to you guys a little bit more about uh, the overarching theme and the ideas uh, and draw a little bit away from the evidence only because of uh, the overlap with last quarter. Okay, so to start, um, so we see a sex difference in outcome uh, in risk aversion and competitiveness between males and females, and we also see differences in social treatment. So women are, are also uh, taught or trained in many ways to be less competitive than men. So for instance, Linda Babcock talks about how if women are aggressive in negotiations, they often get um, uh, chastised for being such and uh, treated very differently than men in terms of how they're socialized to be uh, less aggressive or less competitive. And uh, the only point that I want to make here is that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no role for evolutionary selection. So, so a classic counterexample is uh, incest taboos. So we see uh, a lot of socialization against committing incest, uh, that certainly doesn't indicate that there's no biological basis for incest avoidance. And uh, of course, there's, there's much evidence um, that there is a biological basis, and uh, the, the socialized uh, incest avoidance may reflect uh, the biological basis as opposed to be what's uh, the ultimate cause of the, the sex difference. So I argue that that's, that's certainly possible here, that there could be, um, there could be socialized uh, sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness that either uh, exacerbate underlying uh, selection uh, issues, 
or they could ameliorate such issues, or uh, they could be the only cause, but certainly the fact that socialization goes in the same direction as observed behavior doesn't indicate that there's no role for selection. Okay, so the second point that I want to make is that simply because we see that it's moderated by culture, as the uh, Ganesi, Leonard, and Lisp paper demonstrate, um, where they, they saw that sex differences do differ in, say, a matrilineal society in India than they do in a patch of, uh, lineal society in Africa or uh, Western samples. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there is no role for uh, evolutionary selection. Uh, evolutionary selection is fully consistent with uh, cultural variation um, or with the, the role of socialization. So, uh, you know, uh, going back to incest avoidance, uh, simply because uh, who you are averse to uh, uh, having sexual intercourse with is affected by the way you're socialized, like, for instance, duration of co-residence or whether or not you grew up together in, in, in communally in a kibbutz. Uh, that certainly doesn't indicate that there's no role for uh, evolutionary selection. It's, uh, rather, that evolutionary selection makes often our behavior quite plastic and affected by uh, social upbringing. Okay, so, uh, and then the, the uh, next point that I want to make is that um, some sex differences, um, we, we don't have a good a priori reason to expect them. Um, uh, so, uh, that doesn't mean that there's, there's no reason or we can't come up with one afterwards or we can't find evidence for evolutionary selection, but uh, in some cases the, the evolutionary argument is fairly, uh, fairly intuitive and compelling. Um, in some cases, it, it's a little bit harder to spin. So, so sex differences in, say, mathematical abilities, uh, I would argue, is, is a lot harder to uh, give a <coughs> biological explanation for than, say, sex differences in, in risk of vision competitiveness, which, which I will argue there's a very solid and compelling theory for, uh, namely Bateman in 48 and Trivers in 72 and, and so on, and I'll, I'll go into that argument in a bit. Uh, but I find that argument quite compelling. And I will also present some uh, evidence from the animal literature uh, that supports this theory quite well. Um, and finally, uh, if it is uh, the case that there is a role for uh, evolutionary selection, uh, it's, it's not enough to simply give a compelling argument. Uh, we would want some novel predictions that we then go and uh, test. And uh, uh, that's, in fact, what uh, we try to do. Um, so. Uh, it's not, not so trivial, so in animals it's a lot easier. We can simply run experiments, say manipulate the testosterone levels of, uh, uh, of animals at a young enough age and see how their behavior uh, changes as a result. It's a little bit harder to run such experiments in humans. Um, <laughs> other methods that have been used to show a uh, role for uh, biology or for selection would be uh, twin studies or genetic studies, which uh, uh, it's not so obvious how this would work when you're looking at uh, sex differences. Uh, uh, monozygotic twins necessarily have uh, <coughs> uh, the exact same sex, um, and dizygotic can have the same and can have different. Uh, that, that prevents you from being able to use uh, twin studies uh, in a standard way. Uh, and genetic studies, which look at you know a single gene causing behavior, that's that's also harder to do with sex differences simply because uh, well we know uh, <coughs> the chromosome, uh, namely the Y chromosome, and uh, uh, the gene, namely the SRY gene, which causes uh, uh, sexual dimorphism uh, uh, at a very early age, and after that, uh, socialization is going gonna, is gonna to follow through, and it's all going to be um, co-determined by this one particular gene, so you can't really parse out the effect uh, of that gene on uh, behavior so, so easily uh, as you can with uh, classic genetic studies. So we're going to have to come up with slightly more um, uh, creative and less compelling uh, techniques, um, and uh, so we'll talk about whether or not they're convincing uh, later on. Um, but uh, so that's the basic argument. Uh, that's the basic idea of what, what we want to do here is we want to um, come up with a uh, well. Here's here's what I plan on doing. So I'm going to argue that there is a compelling evolutionary theory backed by solid evidence in the animal kingdom um, that could explain uh, sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness. Um, and then if this theory is behind our sex differences, they ought to be mediated by sex hormones and uh, sex differences in the brain. So I'm going to present the evidence for that, again, in the animal kingdom. And that's going to lead us to four uh, uh, lines of evidence for such mediation. Um, and this is going to be uh, uh, the evidence that uh, this theory, which was originally applied in animals, uh, plays a role in human sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness. Uh, we're going to talk about handedness, which um, 
uh, already talked about last quarter, so I'll go through that briefly. Uh, 2D40, um, uh, which is the, the ratio of the second finger to the fourth finger, and that's thought to be a proxy for prenatal hormones. Facial masculinity, um, that's going to be based on photographs that we take of participants and analyze for what's thought to be um, measures of pubital um, hormones, and then circulating testosterone. Um, and according to the theory, all four of these things should um, correlate with risk aversion and competitiveness even within a sex. Um, and when we, um, uh, and the, if the sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness is caused by uh, evolutionary selection, we should expect uh, risk aversion and competitiveness to have such a correlation. However, a socialization explanation would be, uh, it, do, it does not necessarily predict these. Although, uh, in some of these cases, one could come up with such an explanation. I, I would argue that with all four pieces of evidence together, especially handiness in 2D40, it's uh, quite hard to come up with a socialization explanation. Um, so, we'll get into that ar argument when, when time comes, uh, but that's the, the basic outline for what I plan on doing. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Or are you gonna, um, okay. So, yeah, feel free to, to um, I, I don't know what the social norms are here. Uh, 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 I'm used to being bombarded with questions uh, in the middle, so if there's something that you don't understand, or uh, please feel free to ask. Okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, uh, very briefly, the evolutionary theory. This uh, uh, dates back to Trivers and Bateman and, and many others since. Uh, it's been very, very well developed, and the details are still being argued over. Um, and. The basic idea, though, is that males are expected to be more competitive uh, simply because they have uh, more to gain in, in a competition, uh, namely uh, access to reproductive rights. So uh, uh, when it is the case, and it usually is the case, that females invest more in uh, any given offspring, uh, that makes it more beneficial for a male to gain access to an additional mate than it is for a female to gain access to an additional mate. Uh, and hence, uh, males are going to invest more in gaining such access. And this investment can come in the form of growing larger weapons, uh, or it can come in the form of running faster, or it can come in the form of having a more colorful tail. Uh, there are many different ways in which males can compete over females, but it will generally be the case, uh, particularly when males invest less in parenting than females do, that males are going to invest more in such competitive traits, uh, which uh, uh, correspond in some ways to uh, competitiveness, such as territoriality, showiness, aggressiveness, um, and weaponry. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's the basic idea. Um, and then as for risk taking, um, if we uh, imagine that, uh, that uh, since, again, if we assume this the case, as it usually is, that males invest uh, less <coughs> in parenting than females do, then a male can uh, then the female is capable of uh, multiple females having a single male parent their offspring. Um, and hence, for males, reproduction is more of a winner-take-all type thing, where the, the most successful male is going to gain uh, many of the mates, and, uh, whereas for, for, and many of the offspring. So for males, the um, offspring are very highly skewed, which is to say that some males have many offspring and most males have very few. Whereas for females, this is less... Uh, uh, true. So for females, the um, number of offspring is more flat. So uh, most females have very close to the mean number of offspring. Very few females are going to have many more than that. Um, and the skewedness for males that's not present for females is going to cause it to be more beneficial for males to have um, uh, to take risk. Because when you take risk, uh, you ha have the chance of being the most successful male and in a winner-take-all uh, uh, society, it's very useful to be the most successful and not so useful to be the second or third most successful. And taking risk increases your chance of being uh, the, the most successful, whereas for females, uh, the upshot of taking risk is, is less useful since uh, uh, females have much um, more flat distribution of offspring and the downside of taking risk is, is about the same. You, you die or you get hurt or uh, you hurt your chances of having offspring. The upside is much smaller, so risk becomes uh, less beneficial. So that's the, the basic theory. Does anybody have uh, questions on, on the basic argument here? I guess um, I wonder how you think this argument applies to humans. I mean, it's, uh, if this is an argument for a sort of iconic mammal, but not necessarily to, to all mammals, so a pair-bonded species, it doesn't fit at all. 
And so I wonder yeah. how you think this should apply to your predictions about humans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, so first of all, I will go through the, the animal evidence, uh, and uh, that it's very true that in um, the degree to which you get animal sex differences in competitiveness um, definitely uh, differs depending on uh, the mating strategies you see in that species. So if you have uh, highly polygamous species, you will see uh, a lot more sex differences on these dimensions. And uh, if you see sex role reverse species like seahorses, where the males actually invest more in parenting, you, you can see reversals in this. And so this begs the question, like you're saying, what happens when you're dealing with uh, humans? Are, where do we fit in that continuum? In order for this theory to apply, we need to assume humans are uh, certainly not sex role reversed and uh, not uh, fully monogamous, but somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, closer to polygamous, which apply. And the closer, the more polygamous we are, uh, the more you would expect this theory to apply. And uh, there is some uh, fairly good evidence, um, and uh, I can briefly summarize that to you. But there's some fairly good evidence that humans certainly aren't sexual reversed in terms of parental investment, and uh, we're also certainly not 100% uh, um, uh, monogamous throughout our lifetimes. Uh, males do, in fact, uh, um, show higher uh, Oh, well, okay, so the evidence that we are somewhere between monogamous and polygamous is several fold. So, so for one, um, if we look at sex differences in physiological traits, um, uh, like body size dimorphism, uh, canine dimorphism, things like this, and you map it onto uh, sex differences in other primates, um, then that suggests one piece of evidence that we, we seem to look more somewhere in between primates that are completely pair bonded and primates that um, have more polygamous uh, um, social structures. And so that, that's one piece of evidence that we are not fully monogamous. Other pieces of evidence are if you look at several um, different um, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes or other, um, other tribes in non-Western civilization, uh, they, they have found, and I, can, I have the citations in my paper but not on these slides, that uh, you know, I've seen 10 or 15 studies like this where uh, they do come up with ratios of variance in number of offspring or skewedness in number of offspring between males and females. And males are more skewed and have more variability than females do uh, in these uh, undeveloped um, uh, societies that have been studied. Um, and um, uh, so th those are two pieces of evidence. Uh, a third piece is if we know of several uh, examples uh, where males have had uh, highly skewed uh, reproductive rates. So there are, there are several well-known cases like uh, the Genghis Khan and uh, this Moroccan prince and several others where males have had uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of offspring or, 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 or grandchildren. Um, and there aren't known cases of this for women. Uh, the the uh, record for women is, is closer to, you know, in the 20s as opposed to in, for males is in the hundreds. Um, so those are three pieces of evidence that, that males do have more skewed reproductive success than females do. Um, and all that evidence uh, points to that we should expect the theory to apply in humans. Uh, maybe not as much as, say, in elephant sales where one male controls a harem of 40, uh, but more so in completely pair bonded species. Yeah, I, I don't want to get rid of the talk so we can talk about this more. Okay, sure. Uh, any any other questions before? I... Okay. Um, uh, okay. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the evidence in uh, in animals for for this theory. So uh, first of all, it is generally the case that males are more aggressive, more territorial, have bigger weapons, uh, and are showier than females. Uh, so for instance, if we look at 113 bird species with spurs, which is a, a small weapon that uh, birds tend to have. Uh, that they use for um, uh, both for defense and for competing for uh, mates. Uh, well, we find that uh, in some cases females do have this and males do have this, and in some cases males have it and females uh, don't. But in no cases do females have it and, and males not. And this is this is a, a common theme. So many times, uh, you know, in deer, females female deer might sometimes have horns just like male deer, but uh, sometimes males will have it without females having it and uh, never uh, will it be the opposite. And so this indicates that well, while there are multiple uses for horns or for spurs, uh, like defending against predators, uh, there is a particular use that males benefit from more so than females do, namely uh, competing over mates. Okay? Uh, a second piece of evidence uh, for this theory is that if we look at 
uh, as was suggested a minute ago, the more polygamous species you do find more sexual dimorphism on these dimensions. So, for instance, uh, if we uh, look at two uh, different uh, families of uh, birds, uh, and uh, we look at uh, all the different species in these families, and we measure, say, the dimorphism in tail length, which is used for uh, sexual signaling, uh, the dimorphism, uh, you have bigger dimorphism in species which are more polygamous. And, uh, you know, I've seen plenty of studies which look just like this, either looking at tail length dimorphism or horn size dimorphism or uh, many other sex differences, and you just correlate them among closely related species with a uh, degree of polygamy, then uh, you, you tend to find uh, fairly strong correlations indicating that there is uh, some effect of uh, polygamy on uh, sexual dimorphism. Okay. And then a uh, third piece of evidence is the, the exceptions to the general rule. So as the theory says, when males invest less in parenting, you will get these uh, sex differences. Well, uh, there are occasions where females invest less in parenting, uh, namely phalaropes, seahorses. Uh, there are about 23 known examples where females uh, invest uh, less in parenting than males do. And in, uh, in those cases, in 21 of those cases, uh, the males uh, actually... Uh, are less aggressive, less territorial, less showy than the females. So, you know, an example is the phalaropes, where the males, uh, the, the males uh, will, uh, uh, the females will court the males. They'll follow them around for a while, um, and they'll have very long courtship displays. If another female intrudes, um, the, the the two females can end up fighting with each other. They get very jealous if a female comes close, and uh, eventually. Uh, the female will lay her eggs and the male will take them and he will sit on them and watch them uh, for quite a while while the female will go and court a, another male. Uh, and so that, that fits the theory quite well. The males are doing most of the parental investment and the females are uh, behaving competitively in the way that males typically do. Uh, finally, a, a fourth piece of evidence in favor of this theory is there are exceptions uh, to these exceptions. As I mentioned, in 21 of these 23 cases where males invest more in parenting, uh, do you have uh, do you have males being uh, less competitive than females? Well, uh, there are uh, two known exceptions, uh, one being the three-spine stickleback, and the other one uh, also exhibits the same, uh, the same types of behaviors. And, uh, well, we can ask why, do, why are these two exceptions uh, uh, not exceptional, where namely the females are uh, doing most of the... Uh, the females are doing uh, not, uh, less of the parenting, but they're also being less competitive than the males. So that, that seems to contradict the theory, but if we look a little bit closer, so for instance, um, uh, in one of these species, the female uh, lays the eggs and they go on the back of the male. Uh, the male can carry the eggs of up to six females at a time. Uh, in, another, uh, in another case, the female lays the eggs and the, the male sits on them, and multiple females' clutches can be sat on at the same uh, time during the mating season. And so even though the males are doing most of the parenting, uh, sitting on the eggs or keeping them on his back while he swims around, uh, in fact, the amount of uh, the marginal cost of parenting, namely, if the male gets one more clutch from a female, well, how much more does that cost him? Actually, close to nothing, or much less than the first batch, and uh, much less than the female cost to produce a clutch of eggs, because the male can sit on up to six per season, and the female can only produce one. Uh, and that, that, that means that the male gains more by competing for one marginal, for one additional female. And so, uh, as the theory would predict, uh, it, even in these uh, cases where it looks like males are doing more parenting, since the marginal parenting per the marginal child is less, uh, the male has all the reason to compete for an additional female. Okay? And finally, uh, the last piece of evidence in favor of uh, this theory, and by the way, when I say piece of evidence, there are, I don't know, uh, 100 citations for each of these at, at the very minimal. So, so there's, uh, I'm picking out you know, one example of one study that I know well, uh, or, or that I found particularly well done or compelling, there are, there are many, many, many more. So uh, uh, all of these bullet points are very, very well backed. Um, so the last piece of evidence is uh, they've actually, uh, we can look at variation within a species um, uh, in the amount of parental investment. And then we can ask, well, are the males more uh, competitive in cases where the males do uh, less of the parenting? Uh, and so one example of that is uh, uh, crickets. Uh, well, it turns out, depending on uh, the season, uh, you can get differences in, in pollen load. And there's an interesting fact about the crickets' uh, mating habits is they use um, nuptial gifts. So they have to, in order to mate with a female, 
uh, they uh, give her a, a, a big ball of food, and uh, the ball needs to be of a certain size in order for her to accept it and him to be able to mate with her, and so that kind of fixes the market price of uh, mating. And in some seasons, it's very easy to create uh, these balls, namely if you know there's a there's low de population density and there's a lot of food. And in some seasons, it's very hard to do, namely if there's high population density, not so much food. And uh, since the the price of mating is fixed, uh, there's going to be a, a surplus of, of supply in some seasons and a surplus of demand in other seasons. And when there is uh, a lot of uh, when it's very hard to produce this food, uh, the females. Uh, there's going to be a lot of females who are willing to mate at that given price and not so many males uh, who, who, who are uh, able to come up with uh, that amount of food and so the females uh, eat, are going to uh, end up fighting over the males and you do find that in these cases when, when uh, there's a male with a nuptial gift uh, the females will then end up competing if they, if they both see him and they'll, they'll actually fight with each other quite vigorously to mate with the male whereas in the off season when there's a lot of pollen available uh, the reverse will happen. The, the males will fight over the female. And in fact, we could even experimentally manipulate this, as has been done, where uh, they've put crickets inside of uh, cages and manipulate the amount of pollen available, and they see uh, sexual reversals in uh, degree of aggressiveness or competitiveness uh, in, in the lab, as mediated by uh, um, which parent finds it easier to uh, come up with uh, larger parental investment, exactly as the theory predicts. So, so that's the, the evidence for this theory. Uh, next I'm going to move on to sex hormones. Uh, before I do that, uh, are there any, any questions on it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so, so the reason why I mentioned the last slide of uh, you know, trying to present the evidence for this theory is I want to, I want to make a compelling case that we should, at least if we think uh, humans are not monogamous or sexual reversed, we should expect uh, there to be sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness, at least to the extent that we see it uh, in animals and that there's a compelling theory for it in animals. Next, what I'm going to present is, if we do expect it in humans, then we would, uh, if we do think that there's an evolutionary basis for sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness, then we should expect it to be mediated by sex hormones. And the reason for that is, uh, as I'm going to argue right now, is in animals, when there are sex differences, uh, they are uh, strongly mediated by uh, sex hormones. Um, and, and this makes sense. If we want behavior to be different over the long run, uh, you need it to either uh, be neurologically ingrained or, or to be mediated by hormones. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier than uncoiling the sex chromosomes every time you want the animal to behave differently, depending on whether it's a male or a female. An easier way to do it is to... Uh, simply have the animal uh, develop testes or not, and have the testes develop uh, testosterone or other sex hormones at an early age, which will affect neurological development, or which will, uh, <coughs> the hormones, when they're circulating in the system, will affect behavioral differences. And uh, that's, in fact, the way that uh, uh, animals usually have sex differences, is uh, by, by these pathways. So it's generally going to, to follow that trend where uh, hormones, uh, where a gene, or in, uh, when it's not mammals or birds, sometimes it's going to be temperature or some, something else that causes sexual differentiation at a very early age, will end up leading to um, uh, different uh, phys physiological sexual development of the, of the gonads or of the um, endocrinological tissues. And these will end up developing different sex hormones, which will affect either neurological development or the hormones when circulating in the system will affect behavioral differences. And uh, so let me give you uh, a few examples. Uh, so uh, first of all, sex hormones, they're, they're going to influence uh, primary sexual characteristics like the um, physiological traits that we uh, know males and females define, like the presence of uh, male genitals. Uh, and how do we know this? Well, very simply, if you take like pregnant guinea pigs, or this has been done in many other species as well, and you inject them uh, with testosterone at a uh, sufficiently young age, uh, and you know at what age and exactly how, how you ingest them and what hormone and whether you need to do it also with circulating will differ depending on the species. Uh, and yes, uh, I'm worried, Moshe, that in the interest of time, yes, um, since this is all review, um, yes, and we're really interested in your work. If maybe we could sure accelerate to Absolutely. the evidence on humans that you have. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Uh, I will go through this slide in the next in one or two minutes, and then I'll go to the human stuff. Uh, the human stuff, some of it was, will also be reviewed since uh, Oi talked about it, but that's okay. Um, 
So, uh, yes, uh, sex hormones make a big difference in <coughs> primary characteristics. Uh, secondary sexual characteristics like uh, the size of horns, uh, antlers um, in stags, and uh, it makes a difference uh, not just in mammals and birds, but even in uh, other species where uh, sex is a lot more complicated. Um, okay, so, uh, and then same thing with uh, neurological differences. Uh, there's a uh, very good reason to think that uh, neurological differences between males and females exist. Uh, sometimes they're bigger than other times. Uh, they're often mediated by, um, uh, by sex hormones, and they often mediate secondary sexual characteristics. And uh, if you're interested in the evidence for that, uh, again, as Dan said, it's logically reviewed, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it more if you want later. Um, okay, so uh, now let me go into the four pieces of human evidence. Um, does that sound good? Uh, does anybody have any questions before I do that? Um, how are we doing on time? So I have until one ten. One ten. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so uh, again, I'll go through the hand in this stuff uh, somewhat quickly because Ola talked about this uh, last time. Um, but lefties uh, do have very different brains than righties, so it's not simply a superficial difference. Lefties are more likely to be male, um, <coughs> uh, and uh, lefties <coughs> being left-handed is affected by prenatal uh, exposure to male sex hormones. Lefties are more masculine in other sexually dimorphic traits, so uh, this leads uh, to the understanding that handedness might be picking up on uh, some kind of neurological sex difference. That's the interpretation I'm going to give it, and we can, we can talk about whether or not that's reasonable afterwards. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about this evidence. And finally, um, handedness, I'm going to argue, is not, is not picking up on socialization. While it is true that whether or not you eat with your right hand is affected by how you're socialized, uh, it doesn't generalize to whether or not you um, say, brush your teeth with your right hand, or certainly kick a ball with your right foot. Uh, and uh, we'll collect evidence on both handedness and footedness, so it's unlikely that, that evidence is, being, uh, is just picking up on social pressure. Okay, So that's uh, basically what's going on with handedness. So uh, briefly, I'm going to go through the evidence for each of those bullet points I had on the last slide. So lefties, they do have very different brains uh, than righties. So uh, an example of this, and there are many methods which lead to converging evidence that if you knock out one part of the brain, uh, <clears throat> then uh, it often has a different effect for righties than for lefties. Now this is just correlational, um, so it's not, uh, it's not that the brains are always very, very different, but it's more often to be uh, the case that if you knock out, say, the right side of the brain uh, uh, in lefties, that it has the effect of that knocking out the left side of the brain has in righties. So for instance, if you, yes, please. Yes. Um, are you including them as a lefty? Yes, yes. So, so yes, to be precise, I at least in our data, I know we, we've parsed it different ways and get essentially the same results, but yes, uh, we'll do the standard thing of uh, uh, analyzing righties versus non-righties. So ambidextrous people we, we will treat as, as lefties, um, and, uh, but the, the analysis isn't so sensitive to, to whether or not we do that, yeah. It's just a wee bit off topic, but can you just briefly um, illuminate what the mechanism is by which prenatal exposure to male hormones makes somebody less lateralized brain-wise? It's okay to say no, and we can move on. I'm just yes. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I like to say no, but, but uh, not because I haven't tried uh, to, to find the answer to that, but because I, I, I couldn't find the answer to that. And I've I asked a lot of neuroscientists, and I, I don't think it's, it's, I think it's still a puzzle. Okay, well, um, fair enough. That's fine. Yes. Um, Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, um, so, um, you know, the classic study being done here is uh, you uh, somehow knock out the one side of the brain either temporarily using um, uh, TMS or, you know, using sodium amytal or uh, there have been five or six methods developed over the years that do this. So you can knock out one side of the brain and then you ask the person to do a particular task which uses a particular um, uh, part of the brain, typically, like for instance, asking people to talk, which uses language, which for most people, uh, particularly righties, language is, is lateralized uh, in the uh, left side of the brain, which is to say that when you knock out the left side of the brain, people have a hard time talking. If you knock out the right side of the brain, this, people usually can talk pretty normally. For lefties, 
Uh, it's not always the case, but it's more often to be the reverse. If you knock out the uh, left side of the brain, uh, people are still able to talk, but if you knock out the right side of the brain, they, they have a hard time. Okay? Um, so, so evidence like that suggests that uh, lefties <coughs> have neurological differences uh, than righties. So it's not just uh, something very superficial, like which hand do you, do you write with. Uh, it actually reflects something uh, rather deep. Uh, finally, there's, uh, there's evidence that prenatal exposure affects um, uh, handedness. So uh, evidence for this, for instance, comes with uh, DES supplements, which is a hormone supplement given to pregnant women uh, in the past. And uh, women who were given this hormone supplement, which during development acts in a way similar to uh, uh, male sex hormones, uh, they were much more likely to have uh, left-handed offspring. So for instance, if we look at their female offspring, uh, while they were on the supplement and while they weren't, 7 out of 38 um, had lefties, whereas their sisters were 1 out of 24 lefties. So that's, uh, that's quite a lot more frequent. Um, uh, this is uh, quite a huge effect, indicating that um, uh, DES, or a hormone supplement that acts like testosterone, uh, uh, increases by several fold the rate of uh, left-handedness, indicating that handedness is picking up on uh, sex hormones in, in utero. Okay. Um, and finally, more masculine on other sexually dimorphic traits. So the, um, they perform better on mental rotation tasks. Uh, they're more likely to become architecture students, um, science and graphic arts majors. Uh, uh, all sorts of things where we tend to see differences between males and females. We see differences between righties and lefties in exactly the way that you would predict. Uh, and this shows up in the labor market as well. So um, uh, people that are very successful in the labor market, just like we see uh, particularly in cases where males tend to succeed more than, than females, uh, you see uh, lefties succeeding a lot more. Uh, so they'll make a lot more money. Actually, the, the difference between uh, lefties and righties in terms of income is bigger than the difference uh, between males and females. Um, and uh, uh, <coughs> one, uh, one possible explanation for all of this uh, data that I'm presenting is that handedness is somehow picking up on uh, masculinization. Um, uh, and then uh, social pressure, so, so the evidence that uh, social pressure does affect which hand we write with but doesn't necessarily generalize to other tasks, it's very important for us to interpret this as not just picking up on social pressure uh, because we have measures of both handedness and footedness. And um, so evidence for this, for instance, comes from studies where we look at people who have had social pressure to switch hands and like, for instance, in Taiwan, where you have very low uh, rates of handedness when it comes to eating or writing, where there's a ton of social pressure, only 2% in that society. Uh, in other traits where there's no social pressure, uh, like which hammer you use or uh, which hand you use to, to hit with a hammer or to brush your teeth, you see rates similar to in other societies. Um, so there, there's some other evidence as well, uh, but uh, I think the general consensus is that uh, which hand you write with can be affected by social pressure to write with your right hand. Uh, it won't generalize to other tasks. Um, okay. So does anybody have any questions before I... Yes. Uh, I may have missed it, but what's the proportion of left-handedness among males versus females in general? Uh, so it, it differs uh, uh, between studies. Some are between one point, a ratio of 1.2 to a ratio of 1.8. Um, so vast differences depending on how you measure it and which uh, ethnic group you're looking at. Um, it's it, it, quite a small difference though. If, if it's got this connection with masculinity, why isn't it much more common among males? Okay, so... Uh, Sorry, I don't want to derail you. No, 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 fair, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, handedness, uh, I, I should make clear, uh, is uh, correlated with all those things that I discussed. The correlation isn't, uh, it's, it's stronger than with some measures, so I'll talk about TD40 later, it's much stronger than, say, TD40, but uh, it's, it's still just a correlation. So if we look at, um, uh, you know, studies like uh, uh, this one, uh, so uh, only, you know, 2% uh, of varieties have uh, language uh, lateralized in uh, the left side of the brain, the number is 22% for lefties, but it's still, you know, 78% of lefties have it lateralized in the same part of the brain as righties. So while there is a big difference between righties and lefties, uh, it's just correlational. Uh, and so lefties, uh, it's not going to be 100% indicative of 
so I think it's picking up on some sense of ma brain masculinization. It's certainly not going to be, uh, you know, 100% of the story. And so uh, for, for that reason, you wouldn't expect uh, lefties to be only men. Uh, and uh, there's also a lot of overlap between males and females in degree of masculinization. So even when you look at circulating testosterone, uh, the, uh, the distributions have some, some overlap. Um, yeah. okay. Any other questions before I uh, go into the data? Okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, again, this data was presented last quarter, so I'll try to go through it uh, quickly. Um, but basically, we had... Uh, uh, 1,100 villagers, uh, we measured their competitiveness by having them, well, I'll tell you the task in a minute, and we measured their handedness, we just asked them which hand you write with, which, uh, which foot you kick with. Um, all the analysis is going to be the same, whether we use uh, which hand you write with, which foot you kick with, some combination of these, wh whether we use non-right-handed, uh, as was suggested earlier, whether we use uh, left-handed, or whether... Uh, there are various ways we can create the handedness measure. They all uh, essentially lead to the same, same results. Uh, and for the competitive measure, uh, it's going to look like this. We have uh, subjects throw uh, 10 balls into a bucket. They choose the payment scheme. So they can either get 20 rupees per ball, or they can get 60 rupees per ball if they get more balls than some anonymous competitor. Uh, and they choose which of these two payment schemes they want, either the fixed piece rate or the competitive rate. And uh, we interpret this as those who choose the competitive rate are uh, more competitive. Okay, so that's that's the basic design. Yeah. I'm sorry, just very tangential question, but uh, what what percentage of people answer differently to the two-handedness questions? Is that common or uncommon? It, it, it is common, actually. So I mean, there, there, there's a correlation, uh, that's for sure, and it's fairly strong. But uh, I. Um, something like half the people who answer left to one will still answer right to the other. And do you classify those people as lefties for purposes of Right, so as I said, there's different ways that we can do the analysis. Um, for the analysis that I'll present to you, we use the most lenient measure of, uh, of lefty, which is if you answer uh, anything other than right for any either of those questions, we'll classify you as lefty. And But, you know, we, we can do the analysis differently and we get the same results. Okay? Um, uh, yeah. So you asked them which foot do you kick with, you didn't actually ask them to kick something. We were point. stupid, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, because we had them throwing a ball, we could have simply written that down. Yes, I, I agree, we should have done that. Um, yes. So, sorry, <clears throat> I think I probably misunderstood, but if you, you said if they identified themselves as using the left for either one of those questions? Yes. So if somebody said that they write with their right hand, but they kick with their left foot, you would have identified them as left hand? Yes. Um, and again, the analysis, so if we redid the analysis just using the foot in this question and just using the hand in this question, and we get the same results for both. Okay. Slightly stronger for the foot in this question than the hand in this, but, uh, but the both significant and both very strong effects. Uh, but uh, yes, we use that lenient measure uh, largely because uh, there aren't so many lefties in the population, and so if you, you, you kind of want to... Uh, increase the sample size of, of lefties, and so we're, we're as lenient as possible there. But again, the analysis doesn't um, require that. Right, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so for the basic results, um, uh, males are much more likely to be competitive than females. Uh, this is standard. Uh, it's been well documented in the literature, so, so good. Uh, um, uh, Question. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, um, for instance, this has been done with solving mazes. Um, this has been done with anagrams. Uh, and uh, you find uh, gender differences in the choice of competitiveness for, for all three of those measures. Uh, also, uh, adding up numbers. Um, uh, I've seen all four of those tests, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I submitted a paper showing some domains women will compete more if it's like a female-type uh, female domain. Did you see that paper? No. Uh, I, I, I may have. So I know um, uh, Ori, oh, I, I know Ori has a paper, or Oregon Easy, uh, who uh, has done some of this, uh, did this study with me. Uh, he has a paper where he's looked at anagrams, and he found, he found sex differences there. They're smaller than, than with throwing a ball or um, uh, adding up numbers, um, uh, which is, I guess, consistent with what you're saying. Maybe you or uh, uh, some other people you know have actually found a reversal depending yes. on the domain. Okay. 
so um, I like we were testing a bunch and had people rate them on um, the degree of confidence of men and women. And so uh, we tested health and nutrition knowledge, mind, body, and spirit knowledge, and celebrity knowledge, which are all female type domains. And women chose to compete in one of those domains. So, Yes. Yes. Um, and also, are there uh, cultural issues around money where females maybe would be um, uh, deterred from trying to, to to choose the option where they could potentially make more money because maybe their husbands are going to take the money? Yes. Um, okay. So so. Uh, with regards to the first questions, I, I can show you the, the exact instructions to subjects later. I, I have it in the paper. Um, we did, in fact, explain everything to them, and then we asked them uh, to solve particular examples of how much they'd get paid, and only if they got those questions right did we then bring them into the room, explain to them again while demonstrating throwing the ball, and then had them make a choice. So um, we have good reason to believe that the subjects did, in fact, uh, understand the instructions. Um, which is a concern here. I mean, these were villagers in northeast India with uh, uh, very, very limited education. Um, and uh, th that's definitely a concern. And in fact, we tried to run the risk measure on this population as well, which I'll talk about the risk measure later. And uh, we, um, uh, we, we just couldn't get them to understand it. Um, so so uh, th that's definitely, definitely a concern. Um, yes. So the second question was... Uh, uh, oh, uh, that uh, maybe in that society women are less likely to choose a competitive option because uh, the way that money is handled. And, and certainly, yeah, there are many reasons why males can be more competitive than females. So first of all, this result is quite standard. It's been, you know, in Western cultures as well. Maybe you can argue something similar is going on uh, in Western cultures. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons why women might be less competitive than males. Uh, uh, the only thing that you know, one reason could be the way money is handled, another reason could be because of risk aversion, another reason could be because of overconfidence. There are, there are many, many things that could be going on here. The only thing that, that I want to add is that one of the things that's going on here is that there is uh, some uh, bi biological uh, difference. Uh, I, I, don't, I certainly don't mean to uh, suggest that that's the only reason why there are sex differences. And, but if the only reason there are sex differences is because in this particular society, the way money is handled, then uh, it isn't clear why you should expect lefties and righties to show such a big difference, which I'll, I'll present to you in a second. Maybe one way of addressing your question, I mean, you had patrilineal participants from patrilineal society and from matrilineal society. Yes. Is there a difference in, there, uh, in uh, women's choice across the and, and in fact, there is, which suggests that you know society does play a role. However, uh, there's no difference interacted with handedness, so it's not like the effect of handedness differs between the two societies, indicating that even if um, so, uh, socialization plays a role, which I, I agree with you, or you know the way the society is structured plays a role, uh, I agree with you, it, it, it probably does. Uh, that doesn't negate the fact that uh, biology might play a role as well, as indicated by, well, what we're going to argue is indicated by handedness. Okay? Um, so, um, okay, males are, are also more likely to be lefties in our population, Qu quite, quite a big difference there, something like 1.8 uh, male lefties for every female lefty. Um, and then finally, the, this is the key slide for the handedness results. Um, uh, as you can see, it, even within females, um, the uh, lefties are much more likely to choose the competitive option than the righties, and within males, the lefties are much more likely to choose the competitive option than the righties, and in fact, the difference is, is actually bigger than the difference between males and females, so, so quite, quite a large difference. Yeah. I know they're supposedly competing against the prior person, but it's really just, you know, there's a 50% probability you're going to do yes. better than them and a 50% worse. So Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this could very well just be picking up on, on risk preferences. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. Um, there are other studies which try to parse out with the same competitive measure how much of it is risk preferences, how much of it is thrill from competing, how much of it is overconfidence. All three have been found to play a role. Uh, uh, so, uh, but whether handedness correlates with competitiveness via risk preferences alone is, is, is still 
uh, possible, and that's okay with me. Uh, you know, according to the theory that I presented at first, the, the really doesn't discriminate between competitiveness and, and, and risk preferences. The, the biological theory is, is quite similar, and uh, it isn't uh, it, it isn't crucial to me whether or not we're picking up on, on risk preferences or competitiveness. It would be nice uh, agreed to have a, a cleaner measure of just one or the other, but yes, here it could be either. Yes. A any other questions? Okay. Um, so, um, uh, uh, this isn't because lefties are making more baskets, in fact, they make exactly the same. Um, and uh, this isn't because they believe they're better. Um, uh, and uh, finally, um, okay, so, so study two of handedness, it's just going to be using the risk measure. I, I'm actually going to skip this in the interest of time, but basically we show handedness correlates with risk preferences as well, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that measure. Uh, well, let me, let me just tell you the measure because we're going to use it for the other studies. So basically, we give you $250 to invest in a coin toss. Um, you choose how much of the $250 you want to keep, which you get, well, one subject actually gets paid the balance, but your balance, if you, what you don't invest in the coin toss stays in your balance, what you do invest gets multiplied by two and a half if the coin lands tails and zero otherwise. And so you, you choose somewhere between zero and 250 to invest, and the people who invest more, we, we, we believe are more risk-seeking than the people who invest less. Um, so that's the risk measure, um, and we find that that correlates with handedness uh, as well, but I'm just gonna skip those results and now talk about 2D40 for a minute. So uh, 2D40, the ratio between the second digit and the, the fourth digit, um, uh, it uh, correlates with testosterone to estradiol in amniotic fluid. Now I should mention, unlike handedness and some of the other measures we'll mention later, uh, the correlation is quite weak. Uh, this is a very, very weak measure. Many studies which look at 2D40 fail to replicate. Uh, it's very hard to have sufficient power. It's, uh, you need to have ethnically homogenous samples. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so it, it's certainly a weaker measure than, than handedness um, and more dependent on, on proper study design and large sample sizes of ethnically homogenous populations. Uh, but uh, uh, keeping that caveat in mind, uh, it is thought to uh, correlate with prenatal hormones. It's fixed early in life, and uh, it's the hypothesized mechanism is that prenatal hormone exposure um, uh, affects the growth of different limbs because we have, say, testosterone receptors on uh, different numbers of testosterone receptors on different limbs. Say, on the second digit, there's more testosterone receptors uh, than the fourth digit, and so, uh, I'm sorry, less. So when you have more testosterone, the fourth digit is going to grow larger than the second digit will, and so somehow something like this is thought to be the mechanism by which prenatal hormones will affect the growth of various uh, limbs, and which we can then pick up later on by measuring uh, the second digit and, and the fourth digit. Um, and finally, uh, 2D40, it's, it is low in men, and it does correlate with sexually dimorphic traits. Um, <coughs> for instance, uh, it negatively correlates with sports and musical abilities. Um, and, uh, okay, so in one study we had 125 uh, Caucasian Swedish uh, uh, students, uh, it was very important that they were Caucasian and Swedish because these are uh, very ethnically homogenous populations. Um, and uh, we scan their hands and then we measure uh, using uh, Adobe Photoshop uh, the distance uh, between the, the tip of the finger and the crease uh, closest to the palm. Uh, and we take the ratio from the second digit to the fourth digit, that creates our 2D40 measure. And then uh, uh, we ask them, sorry, instead of in the last study where it was $250, it's 1,700 uh, Swedish kroners. Um, but everything else about the risk measure is the same, just the denomination is different. Um, okay, and um, uh, so what we find is, oh gosh, that's going to be hard to uh, interpret, um, but uh, essentially, um, um, so you guys might not be used to this format, so I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize what, what this table is trying to say. Um, if we look at just um, <coughs> uh, handiness and we don't control for it, for sex of the participant, we find uh, that uh, both left handedness, left, sorry, not handedness, 2D40, left 2D40 and right uh, strongly correlates with uh, the dependent variable. This is the number that you invest in this coin toss. So there's a strong correlation there, there's a strong correlation for right handedness, uh, right 2D40. And then if we control for gender, well, there's a strong correlation with gender. Um, even controlling for gender, there's a um, uh, there, there is 
a significant relationship. It's a uh, uh, marginally significant, I believe. Yes, marginally significant re relationship with the left QD40 as well as right QD40. Um, okay, and um, the effect sizes are fairly small. So uh, being one standard deviation higher uh, in QD40 uh, makes you take. Uh, uh, <coughs> so if you're two standard deviations higher, which is quite a bit, then uh, you will take. Uh, and you're male, then uh, on average you'll be expected to take the same amount of risk as a female would. So two standard deviations is equivalent to the, the gender difference. So, so if the, you know, there, there's some effect there, but uh, uh, it's certainly smaller than with handedness. Okay. Um, uh, there, there have been other studies that have uh, replicated and some studies that have found mixed or, or, or no results um, with, with 2D40 since then. Um, and I can tell you about those other studies later if you're interested. Um, and um, uh, there have, have yet to be other studies with handedness, with testosterone and face, facial masculinity, which are the other two pieces of evidence I'm going to discuss. Um, there have as well been uh, other studies that have uh, uh, replicated these results. Um, okay, so uh, le let me go into the, the next study, facial masculinity and testosterone, unless anybody has any questions beforehand. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, facial masculinity. Uh, this is a sexually dimorphic trait, so uh, basically we're, we're, we're taking photographs of people's faces and we're, we're measuring uh, a bunch of different fixed points on the face, like the distance between the eyes or, or the um, uh, broadness of the, the chin. And uh, <clears throat> uh, these measurements differ between males and females, and they're thought to be influenced by testosterone uh, uh, during puberty. Testosterone is... It, it, is known to affect the development of different bones uh, to different degrees, and so that, that's thought to be the mechanism here. And um, the evidence for that is, uh, for instance, uh, boys with delayed puberty um, uh, end up ha having um, <coughs> uh, more, uh, more masculinized uh, facial masculinity, uh, and boys given testosterone for a year uh, as compared to controlled subjects. Um, that are matched for height also develop more masculinized facial structures. Um, so that's the evidence that it's uh, being affected by uh, uh, pubertal hormones. Um, and uh, the way this study was ran is uh, we had 98 male Harvard undergrads. Uh, we took full uh, frontal photographs. We, um, we also, and I'll mention in the same study, uh, uh, measured circulating testosterone using passive jewel. So we have them jewel into a cup and then send it to a lab. Um, and then we measure risk references using the same measure uh, that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, and the way facial masculinity is measured, uh, as I said, we, we take these photographs, and then we measure the cheekbone prominence, the jaw height, uh, lower face height, and uh, uh, these other measurements, and we create this composite measure uh, based on these. Uh, and that's kind of a, a standard way of doing it, as was used in um, those two other papers who developed the method. Um, okay, and so here are the... Um, the results. Um, uh, so if we just look at facial masculinity um, uh, on the x-axis and then uh, risk preferences on the y-axis, as you see there, I mean, it's not uh, the tightest relationship, but there is certainly a significant correlation. Um, uh, so those who have more masculinized faces invest more in this uh, risk measurement. Um, and uh, if we look at testosterone, again, it's not the tightest relationship, but there is certainly a significant uh, correlation there. Um, and in, in fact, um, yes, I'll tell you that in a second. So, uh, yes, give me a second. Um, uh, so, first of all, uh, the effect of testosterone, so uh, going up one standard deviation of testosterone makes you invest about $17 more. Um, and uh, facial masculinity, one standard deviation makes you uh, uh, risk about $9 more. And uh, the R squared for just testosterone is, is 15%, um, and for facial masculinity is 17 and combined uh, it's 22%. Uh, so, so these numbers are, are actually quite high, in, in the sense that if we take subjects to the lab and give them a litany of, uh, of uh, survey questions and maybe have them do some, uh, play some games or run a bunch of experiments on them, the only other variable that I know of that, 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 that has anything more than explains 5% of the variation. And there have been studies like Barsky et al. and QJD which try to explain differences in risk preferences. All the measures that they have aside from gender uh, explains less than 5% of the variation. 
So the fact that with these two simple measures we can explain 22% uh, is quite quite a strong relationship. Uh -huh. Any any other questions? I have yeah. two questions, and it may be more appropriate for discussion time, but I'm just going to throw sure. it there. So thinking back to junior high, mm -hmm. high school, right? So I was never a jock, but the guys who were the jocks were the ones who developed early, right? The ones who started getting muscular in, in say, seventh grade, as opposed to ninth grade and tenth grade, or in my case, like, you know, never. Yeah. <laughs> so that's question one. Is this the opposite of what you said? Question two, um, I can Wait, see... Wait, I'm sorry, the opposite of what I said, you mean... I thought you said that the, the guys who developed, who entered puberty late, were the uh, ones... Yes, this, Yeah, okay, late yes. puberty were, were the ones with more mass. So that just doesn't really square with my experience as a, as a boy and a man. Um, and observing other boys and men. Um, two, um, so Asian men's faces tend to be less masculinized and black males' faces tend to be more masculinized. And I can see, knowing that, why you'd need to keep your subject populations homogeneous. But having said that, do you see differences in your participants, whether they are different ethnic groups uh, in how they respond? Yeah. Um, so, uh in the Swedish sample, we did everything we could to, to, to not test that hypothesis. Uh, uh, we tried to get as homogenous as possible. At Harvard, we tried and couldn't because of IRB. They required us to, to take everybody. Uh, so I believe for this analysis that, that we present, we include all ethnicities but control for different ethnic groups. Uh, <clears throat> uh, only, and I don't think we were able to look at whether or not there were significant ethnic differences only because uh, we have 98 subjects, so you know our black population might have been two or four or something. So uh, we, uh, in that sense, uh, while it might be interesting to to, to address your hypothesis, uh, for our purposes, it, it was just noise. Uh, 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 which, uh, but I do know of other studies uh, which have found significant, at least with 2D40, significant uh, differences in 2D40 um, in terms of uh, circulating testosterone. I, well, I'm ashamed to say I don't know of any such studies, but I'm, I'm, I would be highly surprised if there aren't. Uh, and in terms of risk and competitiveness, I haven't seen any uh, studies. Uh, I'm almost sure there aren't any, but uh, again, I would be highly surprised if there aren't ethnic differences in, in the degree of risk aversion or competitiveness. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and as far as your first question about delayed puberty, uh, I, I should double check that citation. Maybe I got it going in the wrong direction. Um, this is just purely observation. Yes, uh, absolutely. It could be going in the wrong direction. My, my understanding, though, is that um, with, with uh, several variables, uh, like I, I, I know it's certainly the case with height, that uh, if you wait longer till you go through your growth spurt, uh, that will actually increase your end height because, well, after your growth spurt, you, you stop growing completely. Before your growth spurt, you're growing just slower than during your growth spurt. So if you wait longer till you have your growth spurt, you have more time uh, of slow growth uh, and the same time of your growth spurt. So it's possible, uh, I'm just speculating here that it's the same thing with testosterone, but maybe I, I should check the original site. They might have a, an explanation or maybe I, um, I'm citing it wrong. Okay, any, any other questions before I? Okay, so, um, okay, so, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it for the data. Uh, I can go into to questions, or I have one more slide of, of discussion. Uh, do I have time to, to discuss this slide? Okay. Um, um, what, uh, any, any questions about the data before I proceed? Okay. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so, so I, I, I guess now that I, I've tried to present to you reasons why we might expect evolutionary selection to play a role in, in, in sex differences in risk aversion and competitiveness, the, the question that I'd like to ask is, is who cares? I mean, if we know that there's a sex difference, why do we care if there's, there's a role for evolutionary selection? Uh, in particular, if we, if we want to minimize that sex difference, um, or if we, uh, does it help us in any way to know uh, that there's a role for, for evolutionary selection? Um, uh, and so, so I have uh, four basic answers to this question. Uh, which I'd lo love to hear your thoughts on. This is um, uh, th this is the slide that's actually, uh, I, I, uh, uh, at least at least to me, uh, the most important in terms of selling it to my colleagues who who are economists, not biologists. 
um, who the most common question I get asked when I present the last um, uh, few slides would be, you know, why do we care about animal behavior or about hormones? I mean, how, how is that going to help us uh, determine policy or, or reduce the gender difference? Uh, why, why should we care? Okay, so uh, the answers um, um, that we have so far is that, uh, well, knowing what the ultimate cause is will help us understand uh, moderating variables. So, for instance, uh, understanding that there's uh, a role for evolutionary selection in risk, uh, gender differences and risk preferences uh, leads to the, the following prediction of moderating variables, namely income inequality is going to play a big role. So, uh, in the animal literature, and I know that um, uh, when humans, if we look at humans and like, uh, well, violent behavior, as Margaret Wilson did, uh, they, they discuss the role of income inequality. So with bigger income inequality, you are going to expect big, bigger uh, sex differences in violent behavior. I would expect the same thing with uh, sex differences in, in risk aversion. Uh, and it, it takes the evolutionary argument to, to see that, the socialization argument. Certainly, uh, I don't see a way that that would predict an effective income inequality. Um, um, Another um, another moderating variable, and this comes from a, a paper by uh, Dan Fessler, looking at uh, uh, s sex differences in risk aversion. Well, uh, for women more so than men, uh, risk aversion is going to be affected by uh, uh, disgust, and for men, it's going to be uh, affected more by by anger. Uh, and uh, so, anger and disgust would be two moderating variables that, again, without uh, I, having a biological basis, it would be hard to see why. Uh, those two would play uh, more of a role for males than for females, and why that would mediate uh, risk preferences. And similarly, age and marital status and age of offspring and age of uh, spouse, uh, number of offspring, these are different mediating variables that are thought to, um, uh, that are at least predicted to affect risk preferences, and, and again, it takes uh, having the evolutionary argument to, to expect these variables to, to play a role. Okay, so, so that's the first argument. The second is that, um, uh, if we want to generalize from our current data, so we know that males take more risk than females, what about, say, ambiguity aversion? Or, for instance, um, you know, are males going to be more, uh, more or less ambiguity averse, where ambiguity is uh, something economists talk a lot about, they, they think is very different from risk aversion, which is how much do you care about uncertainty per se, where we don't really know the, the precise probabilities of different events, like you know, the odds of getting into a college or getting a particular job, as opposed to uh, corn landing heads. Uh, are males going to be more or less averse to ambiguity? And well, the evolutionary story uh, certainly doesn't differentiate between uh, ambiguity and risk. Uh, so you would predict the same uh, sex differences there. Maybe without the evolutionary story, you wouldn't have uh, such a uh, prediction. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know if ambiguity is going to look like risk or, or different. Uh, so, so it takes a theory to generalize beyond, beyond the current sample. Um, and finally, um, uh, to determine if the current level of risk aversion uh, is appropriate. So um, <coughs> it takes a good theory to know whether or not we should try to adjust uh, the current sex differences. So, so I'll give you a, a few examples. Um, one is uh, you know, understanding anger. So, so why, why is it that we lose our temper? So uh, Dan, Dan Fessler has a few papers on this, and there, there are others who have discussed that anger essentially acts as um, a, a way to establish either a reputation or a relationship with, with, with a given individual as uh, somebody who is going to defend his rights, who is going to fight back if he's transgressed. And uh, understanding that as the ultimate cause of anger will tell us, well, should we get angry in a given circumstance, or should we try to fight our anger? If somebody steps on your toe on a subway in a foreign country, knowing that that's the reason why we get angry, you should think to yourself, well, there's probably no good reason to get angry now. Uh, because, well, this guy's bigger than me, it's, you know, there aren't any police around, do I really want to start a fight with him? I'm never going to see him again. I'm not going to develop any reputation here. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're in, you know, fifth grade and somebody steps on your toe and asks you for your lunch money, there's more of a reason to get angry because, well, you're going to establish a reputation among your, your peers. You're going to establish a relationship with him that either he can or can't bully you for the rest of the year. And, and so uh, understanding the theory will help tell you whether or not you should, uh, you should fight your predisposed level of anger. The same thing with risk preferences. So understanding why it is that, that uh, you know, I as a man am predisposed to take a lot of risk will tell me, well, should I take 
that much risk in this particular situation. Uh, moreover, understanding, um, having the right theory will tell us, as I mentioned before, the right mediating variable, like we know that, say, testosterone affects your level of risk references. We can ask, well, given that on the way to this negotiation, I uh, flirted with somebody, and we know uh, from Dario Master Perry and, and others that flirting increases your testosterone level, should I therefore uh, negotiate differently this time than I would have if I didn't flirt on the way to this uh, negotiation? Well. I know that testosterone affects my risk preferences and my competitiveness. I know that my testosterone is artificially high right now. I probably shouldn't let that influence me. Um, uh, or, um, so, so knowing the mediating variables and knowing the ultimate cause of, of our risk preferences can help tell us whether or not we have uh, the right uh, degree of risk preferences in a given situation. Um, and finally, um, uh, <clears throat> knowing that there is a... Uh, difference between males and females in risk aversion and competitiveness, if we think that it's completely due to socialization, we might be led to the policy conclusion that we should raise our daughters to be just as competitive or uh, as teachers, you know, teach our students to be just as competitive when there's, there's uh, some evidence that that could be kind of productive. So, for instance, in teaching math, if we try to teach, uh, if we want males and females to be just as good at math, uh, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to educate them using the exact same styles. Uh, in particular, we know that if we uh, have people solve math problems in a competitive way, as I did in third grade, where you know the person who solves the most in three minutes gets a prize, that uh, uh, the females, when uh, doing studies like this, tend to choke under pressure and they perform worse than males. Whereas if you uh, have them do piece rate, you just have them solve as many as they can, and maybe you get a prize for uh, solving uh, a certain number, uh, then uh, female performance uh, actually uh, increases to the level or exceeds the level of males. Uh, and so if we, if we ignore the fact that there are sex differences in, say, competitiveness, we can lead to anxiety in one particular sex or underperformance in a particular sex, which can be counterproductive, especially if our aim is to reduce sex differences. Okay, so that's, um, <coughs> that's all I got. Do, do we have questions?